Good evening. <laughs> My name is Lorraine Yarrow Sullivan, and I'm the executive director of the Fall Island Vocal Arts Seminar. Thank you all for being here tonight. Uh, you're in for a real treat, I can promise you. Uh, I would like to also welcome those watching from the live stream, uh, including Christine and John Lancaster, who I believe are watching right now, uh, big supporters and other donors from afar who couldn't be here tonight. Uh, we're also streaming live via Facebook right now, so uh, welcome to all of them as well. Uh, we'd like to thank all of you for supporting Fall Island uh, for all of these years, uh, especially uh, our Dean Michael Sitton, who is here tonight, uh, and I believe uh, President Kristen Esterberg is also with us tonight. Thank you so much for all of your support. We really appreciate it. Uh, if you look in your programs, you'll see that there are a lot of uh, public events coming up this week. Uh, we'd like to welcome you to all of those. Those are all free and open to the public. So uh, master classes uh, tomorrow morning, uh, Friday morning and Saturday morning at 1030 in this room. Uh, also in this room on Friday night is a wonderful lecture recital uh, with Dr. Gary Bush uh, and the members of our Repertoire Development for Teaching Professionals program. You won't want to miss that. It's always a wonderful time. Uh, and last but not least, our public recital of our final recital of our fellows on Sunday afternoon at 2 o'clock, also here in Snell. So I hope you'll join us for all of those events. Uh, some wonderful music, wonderful performances, uh, and it's up to us to keep supporting American Art Song and keep it going. So thank you so much for your support. Uh, and now I'd like to welcome Stephanie Blythe, Alan Smith, and our guest composer, Juliana Hall. Do I need this? Okay. Probably not, but I'll save my voice for singing later. We are so grateful to have Juliana Hall with us here tonight. I know that all of you are already familiar with her music because we've heard so much of it over the last six years, and it is such an honor to have her on our stage finally. And um, I'm, I know I speak for Alan too when we say that we're so grateful that you're all here tonight to share in this experience with us. And I think without further ado, if, that's, if it's all right with you, Juliana, we will hear your music right away. So let's begin.
song exactly but my mom was a pianist and she said I really would love for you to play the piano she played the piano in church so we um, you know had a, a small church choir and we go to church every week and she would be playing hymns and probably hymns uh, with the words the texts and the beautiful melodies probably was a, a kind of a background and then I did start learning the piano repertoire because my mom would say, hey, you know, I started studying with her when, she, when I was six and then um, got another teacher when I was a little older. But I was in church and um, I was thinking, um, all of a sudden I, I thought, wow, wouldn't it be nice to write a little piece for these, my friends that are in my church choir? So we did that. That was the first piece I wrote. I was like 13 at that time. And that was again with text. And it felt pretty fun, but I didn't know what it meant. You know, because in a little town, you don't really know what a composer does or do they really work and live and that sort of thing. <laughs> so I had no idea. But that's kind of how it sort of began. You know, just did you ever study singing formally? Did you sing in choirs? You sang in choirs? Um, only in the little church choir in my hometown. My mom uh, was the choir director, and she would always say, now it's, you've got to get the words to the congregation. They have to know what you're singing about. So <laughs> that was my singing ability. Now I did try to pretend that I was a singer a bit, but it didn't work out too well. What do you mean by that? What do you mean by that? <laughs> I wanted to be a, a singer like a, a actress singer. You know, that sort of thing. You know, when you're in a small town, you want to be a many things and yes. uh, really you don't know how to do any of it. And you don't have a way to learn because uh, there's just not, it's just not in the culture. But I, uh, you know, finally went away to a bigger town. And did that, that broaden your view of what that was, what writing music and yes. playing? Yes, I went to Cincinnati, the conservatory, because that was like four hours up the river. And, <laughs> and um, 
my mom always said, I want you to go to Cincinnati. That was like the place to be. So I did that, and I was working really, really hard as a pianist because I had come from this little town. And I thought, wow, I gotta really work hard to get you know, up to snuff with all these beautiful pianists and musicians. But uh, um, one of the composers there said, you know, um, I think you should try composing. I had taken a class for performers, and uh, he said, I think you have a knack for it. But I really didn't know what he was talking about. You know, I was back in a little town saying, oh, I've got to practice. So, <laughs> you Can know. you tell us a little bit about the first song that we heard and, and about the next song that's coming up? Sure. The first song, um, A Birthday, um, is the first song of a cycle of Christina Rossetti's um, um, settings. Uh, a friend of mine in um, CCM, at CCM, one of the uh, um, compos or the um, soprano, the soprano there on the voice faculty asked for a uh, Christina Rossetti cycle. So I wrote it for her, uh, well, a couple years ago when she did the premiere in Cincinnati. And um, the birthday is the first song and it's um, it describes this young woman I, I call Christina who um, is just beginning um, her her journey into life she's young she's and just fallen in love she's it's unblemished love she's everything looks wonderful she's gladder than this her heart is happier than this Everything is um, very joyful, and she's enjoying that right now. I mean, in the cycle, as she goes through the journey, things come up that life happens to bring to all of us, and it ends, um, you know, through her cycle of life from beginning to her death. But even in the death, it is hopeful. She's everything will be all right. Is what. Christina is kind of um, saying in that poem. And the, in this poetry, was this chosen by the by the artist for which you wrote it, or you chose the poetry? We worked on it together. Um, she would send some ideas, and then I would think about them and, and read through, and maybe work, work on it a little bit, like uh, maybe we could try this and this, until we got that narrative of beginning to end. But it was kind of both of us. Have you frequently done collaborations like that with, with singers? Um, not often, actually. I think that might have been the first time. What did you think about it? It was fun. It was fun because she really had a, a real sense of what singing, or what a poem would be like, um, and how she would, might feel to sing it. So uh, I think she, um, I thought it was very enjoyable. It's a beautiful song. Oh, thank you. It's a beautiful work. But I'm always fa I, I, it's, it's always fascinating to me to, I've had music written for me. <laughs> I've had music written for me, but it, it's very infrequent that I'm actually part of the, of the process from the beginning. Oh. And I think that's fascinating, yeah, the it, idea. It was, it was really nice. Um, you know, it was nice because she, she has such a feel for Christina's poetry. I think we both felt like, wow, this is it, you know, once we came to that synthesis. I think it's wonderful. Thank you. And beautifully performed, by the way. Indeed. Beautifully performed. <laughs> I mean, it's, it's odd for me to sit here across these lovely folks and not, and not say something just to introduce them to you. Um, because we've just been here now a couple of days and we're getting to know one another. We've had two master classes. And we've had our, we have a lovely poetry evening where we recite poetry to each other and get to know each other that way. But this is our fantastic seventh season group of brilliant artists. And I'm so excited that the first time anyone gets to hear them is singing your music, Juliana. Would you like to talk about the next song? Um, the next song, is that the Emily? North, Northeast Storm. Yeah. Oh yes, Northeast, Northeast Storm. Storm. That is a letter from Emily Dickinson to her brother, Austin. And um, it was written when Austin was in college. And so um, Emily was trying to 
let them know what's going on at home. And it was quite a traumatic evening she was writing about. And um, I wanted to tell you that Vinny, when she is, um, Emily is talking about Vinny, what she is playing is the raindrop prelude of Chopin, just in case you um, hear the, the melody and think, oh, I know that song, <laughs> what is it? But um, other than that, it's very fun. Um, Emily has quite a sense of humor, and it, it was really fun to write. It's very melodramatic, and I think uh, Rachel really has a good sense of fun, and um, so I, I hope you enjoy it. Well, let's hear them. Let me see. 
I'm sure I've done it. Um, I, oh, a Rilke song, I set uh, the Chopin E, e major uh, etude with uh, that beautiful, uh, that tune that was so gorgeous. It was about a girl who was playing the piano and she was practicing. And um, I had the same idea, the melody of the Chopin going through um, in the background. And the Chopin seems to set stage so beautifully. Mm -hmm. It's perfect for you as a pianist because you would have known all of that. Yes, that's so right. <laughs> it's, in, it's in your molecular structure probably. Yes, I think so. Was there anyone in your development? I mean, so many of us have, have, can point to a moment in their lives where they found the right, let me, let me, I'm going to, I'm going to, you don't know who I'm quoting right now, but I'm gonna quote someone that is very near and dear to, to all of us. Her name was Esther Scott. And Esther, uh, this, the, Esther is um, one of the two people that this week is, is dedicated to, as well as Alan's lovely mother, um, both of whom left us this year. And I, she frequently would say, when the student is ready, the teacher appears. What, did you, is there a moment that, you, that this happened for you as a composer? There is a moment. Yeah. There is a true moment. And he says the same thing. His name was Martin Bresnik at Yale. He, um, I, again, it took me, you know, I was 26. I was pretty up there. <laughs> And I was trying to find my way. I had just come from New York City to, I had been practicing and practicing. I thought, oh, I've just got to be a pianist. I was studying with Seymour Lipkin at the time, and he was so fabulous. But then I went to Yale as a pianist, and I thought, um, I'll just keep trying, you know, because this is the way I can get to the next step. But I took a class. No, it was actually, it was lessons um, as an elective with Frederick Shevsky, the pianist. And um, I started writing songs. Uh, it was just a funny little time. Somebody had given me some Sylvia Platt poetry. And I thought, wow, there's something, some connection. I don't even know what it is, but there's some connection. I feel it. And I was still kind of looking for that place, you know? So I kept it in the back of my mind. So, but everybody started saying when, when I started writing those songs, they're pretty good, they're okay, <laughs> you know? And then I remember sitting and getting a cola and thinking, and thinking about it, and Martin came over and he said, you know, I think you should really start studying composition. And I started thinking, I'm gonna try it. I'm gonna see if that's right. And I started during that year and the year after that I was at Yale uh, writing more songs and more songs and it just so happened things started clicking. I had a friend. And you know how things work when they're going the right direction. My friend was a soprano, Karen, and we did song after song and we just had the best time and I felt like I think I found something. Finally, you know, I, I, the practice thing is like, it wasn't quite right, it was close, but it wasn't quite right. But my friend Karen and I, we had such fun, and Martin was so, so supportive, and then he said, now, we have to convince Jacob Druckmann that this is okay. So, uh, you know, he was the head of the department, and so I kept writing, and Jacob started saying, well, Pretty good too, and so it, you know it just started working out. So that was that right at Yale, and those guys have always been my best best buddies ever since. Leon Kirchner and and Frederick Shevsky, all three have been like wow. Uh, you know I've been thankful for them because they've shown me it's so good to have a place in life. You know where you feel like it's okay. This is this is pretty good. There's something about finding a place that's safe. Yeah, that's it. That fosters creativity. Right. You know, it's the, it, there's nothing like it. And now, yeah, it's just to have that little room that I grew up in the attic with a little piano and I can see out the window and I have these beautiful poems. I, that's 
Good. You're Dickinson. <laughs> With, without the agoraphobia. That's great. But, uh, well, I'm, I'm really glad to be there in that little room. You know, every day. Very thankful. And he showed me the way. When you, uh, I've known you just a short time, delightful uh, time knowing you, and I've noticed that when you speak of texts, a special joy comes to your face and lights up your eyes. Last night when you read a poem, you said that the poet was a really great friend of yours, and then you quickly said, and I've never met her. <laughs> and that, that was so very beautiful. Have you noticed particular things about texts that attract you? They're um, usually very lyrical, and they're saying something that makes me think about life, uh, makes me stop and take a look around, or it catches me in moments when I'm going from here to there, and I think, oh, look at that. Again, you know, mm -hmm. just um, think texts that make me uh, feel like something, touch you know, the, the heart, just like uh, the, poem, the poets have a way of doing that so beautifully. Can you tell us about the next poem, When the South Wind Sings? Oh, that is such a beautiful poem. That's uh, Carl Sandburg, and it was written uh, in his early uh, poems. It's uh, very gentle, very lyrical, and very beautiful. And um, the, po the poem, the song that they're going to sing is, um, what is it called, the moon, the harvest? Under the harvest, when the south wind sings under the harvest moon. Under the harvest moon. Yeah, it's a, it's a text that is so delicate and so uh, imaginative. The harvest moon, a little bit more color in the moon, a little brighter and is shining over the field. And he can see all these beautiful little colors. There's a little touch of death, but death is very beautiful at the time and friendly and warm. And then there comes love and love is remembers, brings back beautiful memories. It's, it's one of those texts that it's it's a quiet time where all the little details, like it's like painting with a little tiny brush and you can see all these nice little colors. So I think, you know, if you just um, enjoy the, the, the colors that Carl Sandburg is speaking of in the images, you know, it, it'll speak to you in a nice way. It's very beautiful and sad. Oh. Here now.
Juliana, would you say that there is a particular sound or texture that is a kind of a hallmark of your compositional style? Um, a sound maybe in um, colors that are changing constantly. Mm -hmm. And I think I do that because I think um, I improvise uh, mostly because I am a pianist, but um, I don't have a set key, but the tonalities come from one harmony to another harmony, depending on the text. So um, I think the texture, and it's very pianistic writing, I think, because um, it's just, it, it's fun to, to uh, have the text to make the different colors and the, play with the piano as, as almost like painting a little bit. So probably, um, and the harmony, I think, doesn't sit too long in one little, and I think that's what makes it a little bit tricky for singers is, and I try to always have the, uh, a, a nice center pitch in the piano, but um, changing around harmonies is, that's a um, interesting and a little bit tricky thing to do, but I think that's what kind of uh, gives my songs a little bit of uh, a sense of um, the, the, the sound that they have. Mm -hmm. it's just I, I, I would have to say, that I, I think you're right. I think that your songs are not, they're not, as a singer and as somebody who's heard people prepare these, I, I don't, they're not, they're definitely not always for the faint of heart. <laughs> um, because they are, it, they, they do demand a, a level of skill, which I think is magnificent. For me, I, I, love, your, I love your use of chromaticism. I, I hear that so much in your music. And it, it is so, it's very sensual for me and very beautifully slippery. I love that. <laughs> it's really wonderful, but it never gets away from you, which is great. Do you hear in your own music any particular influence of other composers? And do you hear any influence of non-musical issues or people? Um, I think probably I'm influenced a lot by all the piano literature that I've studied for many, many years. You know, I kind of have it in my fingers, and I probably have a certain, like, fundamental, um, un back, uh, underneath kind of a core of, you know, there's Bach, there's Beethoven, there's Schumann kind of mm -hmm. feeling, but then I go beyond, you know, that sort of thing. But I, I think that's probably um, the um, center of it is just in the, being a pianist for so long. You're so text driven. Are there other non musical influences that, like, I don't know, painting or scenery or architecture that spark I you? I don't think so. I think it is really in the text. I mean, if there's the poets, they speak so differently. Mm. I mean, every poet is like mm. another world to mm -hmm. me, I think. Mm -hmm. I mean, the, just the ones that you've heard, they just have such a different. Um, color in themselves, so that gives me a chance to go with them in their world. Were you drawn to poetry as a child? Um, not too much. I, I did love literature, mm -hmm. but um, we didn't do a lot of poetry. I, I think the first time I had one of those moments that you were speaking about, that I was in high school, and s there were two times and somebody said, Julie's pretty good at that. And that was in English. And I was surprised, and the teacher was like, whoa, wait a minute, she, she can do English pretty well. And then I, another teacher said, started was starting um, to, we were gonna study Shakespeare, and it just pulled me in. It's like, wow, that, there's something to it, you know, that I could feel that that was gonna be later, you know, something that, Do you ever write poetry? Uh, no, never. I've never tried. I, I'm a little afraid to, maybe. Maybe that's the next thing that's waiting. Ah! <laughs> <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> poetry is, is often well written in the little rooms, you know, <laughs> with a little desk and a little window. Yeah, I like the little rooms. Something happens. 
Would you like to talk about the next song? Yep, what do we got? Death's Echo. Mm. Death's Echo. Death's Echo, um, it's a, the center of a cycle called Death's Echo. It was written at a long time ago, uh, well, and it was pre uh, premiered at Yale in 1995. It was written for Richard Lally, the baritone. He and I did the premiere. And um, it was early for me in my writing. I was kind of looking for poets. And I remember writing to Dominic Argento and saying, I have found the most beautiful, wonderful poet. And he's, <laughs> he's kind of laughing at me. Like, yeah, finally, <laughs> you know, you get, but really, but Auden was one of those, you know, because I had started so late, you know, I started out with Emily Dickinson, but I gradually working my way through all these great poets, but Auden was just so, so beautiful, and it's rich and deep, and I thought, baritone, Richard, and we'll just have such fun, and um, so it's a cycle of five songs, and the, um, the subject is, um, well, there are three subjects, really, uh, death and time and love. All of the, the experiences and the emotions and all the things that humankind we deal with. In this song, Death's Echo, um, it's really uh, about death. There are two characters. There's the narrator and there's death. And the narrator is saying to everyone, wow, look at all these people that they're so, they've got such nice desires and hope and filled with you know, good things that they can do. Travelers and fishermen, just the ordinary men. But then death comes and he says, not to be born is the best for man. Dance, dance, dance till you drop. You know, he, he just really kind of puts a, a dark side to everything. <laughs> kind of closes, but so it's a perpetual motion. But you hear the, the two voices kind of going back and forth very uh, quickly, kind of. The, the human side saying there's hope and then death coming in saying, dance, dance, <laughs> dance till you drop. And so it's, it's, a, it's a dark piece. But, but the whole cycle comes out in love as the end. So everything works out. And I like the hopeful endings of things. Me too. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Slightly death's coercive rumor. 
I'm a composer. <laughs> I think that's about as best as I can do. That's you know, perfect. Yeah. It's, it's neat, though. I mean, it is nice to be a woman also. Um, because I've found that, um, you know, we need men composers, we need women composers, we need all people to write music. And just like we need beautiful singers, all singers, you know, so. That's great. It, it makes me giggle sometimes to myself if we say Gabrielle Faure, we don't say male composer, no. right? No. And so um, that's yeah. terrific. Thank you for saying that. <laughs> Juliana, do you like singers? I love singers. <laughs> well, I only ask you that because it's so apparent. I shouldn't have to add, put you know, it's a Q and A. So I, I, one of the things that, that, that strikes me, I, it's interesting. The first time I heard your music, I was looking for some song settings and our dear friend, Glenn Dower Jones at Classical Vocal Re Reprints, um, sent me some of your music. He said, I think you'll like this. And I was absolutely floored. And what, and, and all of a sudden, it was as if it was meant to be because I just kept hearing your music. Oh my if, and uh, after I got those first scores, I, I went to Tanglewood and, all, and I was hearing people sing your music in classes. And then I was hearing people sing it here. And one of the things that is very apparent in your music is that you like singers. Oh. You know, and it's, it's not that you don't ask us for excellence, you do, but there's a, there is a kindness in your writing that is, that is really beautiful and very attractive. You know, there's a sensation sometimes when you sing music that you, that is really, that, that makes you feel good, it makes you sing well, you know? You know what I mean? From the piano standpoint, too, your music feels good in the hands. Oh, I'm glad. I'm glad to hear. I think uh, that is really most important for performers, uh, no matter if it's instrumental or, or singers or what. You know, the, the uh, performers have to feel good so that they can not worry about the, you know, what technique or anything beyond making the music speak. It, it's, you, there's the word idiomatic, but I love Stephanie's term kind. Your music just seems generous to the people that are going to perform it. Oh, I'm glad to hear it. Thank you for telling me. No, not at all. It's a pleasure to tell you. When you are, when you, uh, we frequently talk about, in classes, we frequently talk about the direction of how we learn music. So I talk, frequently we'll talk to singers, and I'll, we'll, we'll, we'll frequently ask singers, when you approach a song for the first time, what's the first thing that you do? And many times the, the answer is the answer I'm looking for, which is I look at the text first, and sometimes it's not, and when it's not, it's okay, because that's exactly the way I used to learn music. Um, what is your, uh, and, I, and I frequently will say, um, you know, if you don't look at the text first, you're not approaching this the way the composer did. Because the composer is led text first. So when you are composing, is there a, is there a pattern that you follow? Is there a, is there a set, is there a template as in terms of how you write? Um, yes. Okay. There is a definite, I have found my rhythm, I believe. And I do it every day um, a certain way. Um, a lot of times, um, I just read and read, or let it sit, and just read and, and read, it, read it at night when I'm, before I go to sleep. I don't know, you know, sleep and just let it kind of, then once I feel like, oh my goodness, I, everything is quiet. There's nothing to, it has to be like a very peaceful time where there's nothing in my mind that can distract from this quiet. And it feels like, I think it's time to start work, you know, on this cycle. Um, so I go upstairs with my little 
poem that's all cut out and tape it to the piano. And after I uh, read it again and read it again and think about um, the first, and actually, you know, my husband and I, we talk about the poems too sometimes, and I still let them sit. But once I'm ready and it's there, I just start, um, start sketching. And, but I have to feel like I know that poem so well and it's so deep within my bones that um, it is ready to write. And um, I, I say a lot of prayer. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and I think now's the time and I've got to find exactly where that world that the poem, that the poet has made, created, I have to be right with them. And so I kind of feel like I'm working with the poet together in our own little world in the attic kind of thing. It's just a, but it, and then I sketch really, really fast from beginning to end. I, I feel led by, you know, pulled through. And I have to be there the, that time. It just takes a couple of days of just intense sketching. And I go from top to bottom, at, you know, crash through, just getting everything down as, as well as I can to uh, really see what's there. And then I put it in Sibelius, and this is a, such a nice thing. I mean, I used to think computers, I can't do it. I'm just way, mm -hmm. way past. But they are so helpful because I can see it so clearly and cleanly. And then I can say, oh, yeah, that word, maybe a little bit of a uh, little more color here, or a little, little more time there for this. Mm -hmm. You know, but I can, after the sketch is sketched, and I can see it clear in a nice uh, printed version, then, um, you know, I can kind of adjust a little mm -hmm. bit. But that helps to really be able to, to uh, see it so nicely printed. And then, you know, then the, the next stage of editing comes. But the, the first comes from a lot of time reading and getting it in my I'm going to say, I'm going to quote you on that from time and memorial now to think it's about how, they, how composers look at their, at their texts. What can you tell us about the next poem, uh, Marianne Moore's Dream? Oh, it's a dream. It's fun. It's a lot of fun. Marianne Moore is a very colorful poet. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, too. Very lyrical. Dream is a, um, a fun song. She's talking about... Um, the world of classical music. And um, we were talking today, um, Maggie was telling us a little bit how she was thinking about it, but there, she was saying like Bach is, is the, uh, the star of this song, and he kind of is. And the, um, it's, the piano writing is kind of harpsichord-like, and it's just, uh, it's in the context of, of five, uh, five songs, cycle about music. It's dedicated to my mom. Mm -hmm. And um, I don't think she'd like it too much because it <laughs> <laughs> it's not as pretty as some. Um, you know, she likes the nice melodies and kind of thing. But um, but I think she would like it because she's it's uh, music. And uh, that was her life too. So um, just uh, have fun with it.
projects are you working on now? Can you share any of them with us? Are they top secret? Oh, no, no, not at all. Um, they're not top secret. Um, I'm just finishing a piece, really. Um, Margaret Whitmer is the poet. It's a cycle about women's rights. Um, there's, uh, it was commissioned by Seattle's Art Song Society. They're doing a year of social justice concerts. And they asked me if I wanted to write a piece about for women's rights. And I said, that'd be great. <laughs> but I didn't know really any poetry, uh, you know, that would be just right for that. But she is a wonderful poet. She's uh, around, she's shared actually the uh, Pulitzer Prize with Carl Sandburg. But, you know, like I didn't know her, you know. But she is a uh, very to the point uh, she says what she's really thinking in very beautiful ways. So that's what I'm just now proofreading, and then I'm going to go to one of the fun pieces after this. The women's rights was kind of took my breath. You know, it was, it was dark. It was heavy. It was had a lot of um, just a lot of energy, and we got to do this. We got to you know help people. And but I'm going to go to something fun. Billy Collins, uh, the piano lesson. And I was just thinking of that when you were reading your, your poem yesterday, how, how much I love Billy Collins also. Indeed. So um, he'll be coming up next. Um, and that's for Andrew Fuchs. Andrew Fuchs. Oh, we know him. Yes, Andrew, we know him. Andrew, Andrew, Andrew Fuchs. Fellow here. He, was, he, was part of our, he was part of our very first season. That's yeah, right. Yeah, I thought so. I yeah, thought, yeah, right. yeah, yeah. So um, he's a sweetheart. So I thought, well, you know, maybe he would have fun with we're going to do that after the uh, women's rights summer. Fantastic. Tell us about Night Dances. That was one of your first pieces. Oh, yes. my goodness. That was fun. That was a fun piece. Um, that was written a long time. Yeah, very, very, very first. 1987, mm -hmm. I think. And um, I was out studying with Dominic Argento, which I really, really loved. I was in Minneapolis for about a year. And... Um, it was commissioned by the Schubert Club out there for Don Upshaw. Don was uh, just starting out, and I was kind of just starting out too. And they said, "Do you know Don Upshaw?" And I said, "Nope." And they said, <laughs> <laughs> "They said, well, let's go to Ravinia and you can hear." And I thought, "Oh my goodness, what a beautiful sound! Oh, she was so fabulous." So I said, "Wow, okay." So I wrote up this next piece for her. And Margot Garrett, they did the premiere, and uh, she um, played it, sang it several several times, and made it fairly popular around for singers, which has been awfully kind, awfully nice of her. But um, this piece, the song that is from it, the the cycle is six songs on women uh, poets. This is Emily Bronte, and it's Lullaby, and it's uh, I think that third or fourth in the in the middle of the cycle. And it's all about night. So this is your lullaby piece.
interesting that you that you um, that you talk about night dances the way that you do. It's because um, and how kind uh, Dawn it was to to sing your music and to and to talk about your about night dances. But I have to tell you that night dances is a staple of 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 singers' libraries now. People know these pieces and they love to sing them. We have people sing them all the time here. They've been presented in recital at least once, if not twice, and they are, I hear, I hear night dances all the time. So it's really, a, it's wonderful to, it must feel wonderful to have a piece that is in the canon. It's you know? amazing, I didn't realize. Well, no, wait, wait, well, I'm here to tell you. It's, <laughs> it's my job, I tell you it is now. And I've always been drawn to Lullaby because Generally, when you hear a lullaby, it's very still, and it's and it's well, it's lulling, and this is anything but. Yes. It's really busy. It is busy. Yes. And and when it dips down into the bottom, you know that sleep, the sleep. It's so I I just love it. What what were you thinking about when you were when you composed this song? I was thinking of storms and mm -hmm. the sea and the rocking. And it was not a peaceful lullaby. No. But uh, I think it ended up okay. Oh, but, yes, you know, it did. It <laughs> in the end, it in the end it's all right. But I know what you mean. There, there's not a, it's not a you know, quiet little thing. Well, it's children frequently of, are not quiet little that's things. That's true, too. <laughs> yeah, that's true. Do you feel that you have developed and changed, evolved as a composer since this piece in 1987? I, I do think so. I, I've been writing like, constantly since um, that piece um, and I'm hoping that I've learned how to do it better and better how to get a sense of what the poet is saying and how to make that come alive you know and how to make help us or write so a singer will enjoy singing it you know that's that's all I've been trying to do for the last 30 years and I'm hoping I've gotten a little bit Keep of it going. <laughs> oh no. I think you're one of the most prolific composers that I know. And the thing that's also lovely is if you if you look Juliana up on Facebook where she's very very present. Um she spends a lot of time thanking people. <laughs> She never ever, let, she, she's, her heart is so full of gratitude and she never shirks her, it's like a responsibility. Oh, it feels, I mean, I am the most grateful and the most thankful composer. But, but we are too. <laughs> <laughs> I just want you to know that we, we are, feel the same way. I want you to talk to us, you talk to us about uh, Don Upshaw being a type of muse to you. Oh. And we're sitting next to a person who is quite amused to a number of composers. And I'd love to turn the corner to the set of songs of that so sweet imprisonment oh. and talk to us about that process and writing for this muse. Oh, <laughs> I, was, I was so thrilled. I said to Stephanie, I'm going to be 60 coming up. And I want a real nice present. Can I write you? A, can I write a set of songs for you? And Stephanie said what? I said yes. <laughs> and I was this, happy birthday. And I was like, um, I can't sleep. And she said, just put your head on the pillow and just relax and think low. <laughs> uh, <laughs> I said, do you have any requests? And I said yes. Write it for contralto. Yeah. Right. And boy, did you ever. I was hoping so, you know, because I love your, uh, David, my husband, he, he started bringing CDs home, you know, from, that you have been singing. I was listening over and over to this beautiful, beautiful voice of yours. And it's been the most wonderful time, just oh, getting to know you. your voice. And you know what I really think is so wonderful is how you communicate from here to there, right to the audience. It just speaks. The words, the text come right, right to the heart of each person. Well, thank you. And it's so incredible. And I was thinking, um, these are these are love songs. These are um, poems by James Joyce that I set for Stephanie. 
and I was thinking, what a wonderful person, what a wonderful voice, and to be able to communicate, uh, I've just got the most perfect singer to be able to take these songs, this wonderful subject of love, and present it to the world. And I'm just in the, so uh, grateful. Oh. <laughs> I'm totally too. grateful. What, what made you, what, what brought you to Joyce? Well, here we go again. My husband. <laughs> it was a funny thing. We started looking for poems, and David has been one of these. He's getting to know my poetry better or close to better, or almost as good as, as I do. He really knows the, the style, something beautiful, something lyrical, and something that says something. Mm -hmm. You know, something that will go from here to there. And so um, David said, take a look at these Joyce poems and see what you think. And uh, we read them together, mm -hmm. and uh, he was right. I said, wow, let's send them to Stephanie. It's, it's very funny because when she, when she sent them to me in, in an email, the first thing I did was read them to my husband. <laughs> <laughs> Who's also named David. Who's also named David. <laughs> And we were, we were absolutely thrilled uh, to read these poems. They're, ab they're just wonderful. And I'm embarrassed to say I didn't expect it from Joyce. And I didn't either. I really didn't. <laughs> I mean, I slogged my way through, you know, the first 10 pages of Ulysses. I, I tried. I really, I honestly did. I was here when I tried to do that, you know? But it just, there is something so beautiful and poignant and honest. And when I think about your music, those are the words. Mm -hmm. Beautiful, poignant, honest. And what do you think about playing this song now? The, the song that we're going to do is, uh, one thing that I feel about your music is that you are a harmonic sensualist. You talk about the tonal centers that shift the key centers, and I find, um, in this particular song, there are shifts of diatonicism, so key centers, but over almost every key center is a really delicious sensual chromaticism as well that really captures the concept of the love poetry, the harps that, yeah. that are painted in the piano oh, yeah. part, um, and it just feels great in the hand. Oh, I'm glad. glad to hear. Shall we do it, Ms. Blythe? I think we shall. I think also that um, I'd love to announce to all of you that we will be doing the world premiere of this beautiful cycle in New York in January of 2019 um, under the auspices of Sparks and Wiry Cries and with, you know, led by the great Martha Guth who has joined us today. We're so happy to have you here, Martha. And, um, and I can't wait, I'm so excited. But for now, we'll just hear the world premiere of one of the songs.
public events. We are so, so happy to see you here, and we'd love to see your smiling faces all week long. And don't forget our final concert on Sunday. Thank you so very much. Good night, everyone.